Good evening, everyone, and welcome to You and Your Health. Today, we are glad and happy to have amongst us or with us um, Dr. Barbara Entwa. She has been with us for uh, the beginning or from the beginning of this program till now, and I hope um, she would continue to come on the program as and when we need her. She has been on the program to talk about a lot of diseases, including cervical cancer and many more. And today, she is coming to talk to us about um, cardiovascular diseases. Dr. Barbara Entra is a board certified family medicine physician with over 30 years of experience. She obtained her medical degree from the University of Ghana Medical School and completed her residency in family medicine in Tulsa, Oklahoma. She is an advocate of women's health and preventative medicine and always encourages her patients to incorporate lifestyle changes in their health management. So um, without spending or wasting much time on her credentials, let's invite Dr. Barbara Entra to the studio. Hi, Doc. Hello, how are you? I'm fine, thank you, and you? I'm well, thank you. Well, today, Iroko is not around, so I'm, I'm managing all the stuff <laughs> in here. <laughs> I hope our lovely viewers would bear with us if there is any technical glitch or something else that comes up. Um, so today, we are glad and we know that you are coming to talk to us about cardiovascular diseases. But um, before you go on, I think I would have to thank our last speaker who um, discussed with us and um, various topics uh, last week. And I, I, I would encourage everyone to go back to watch it if they did not. I mean, she was awesome. The, the talk was so brilliant. And I mean, I know men and women are going to benefit from that talk. Um, Dr. Barbara Intua, yes. before you go to your topic, I would want us to talk a little bit about your book. Okay. <laughs> so, um, this is your book, I guess. Mm -hmm. Or this is your book, I know. Mm -hmm. and, um, I bought one for myself. I read it, and it's very educative. Why should men get it? Well, that's a very important question, I think. Uh, I just came back from Ghana about uh, two weeks ago, and... Uh, that was a question that was put to me on one of the uh, TV shows. Yeah. And yes, men should get it because although it says a woman's guide mm -hmm. to her uh, health and uh, to her body and her total health, we find out that about 80% of the stuff that is in the book applies to both, both men and women. And so um, if men get that book, they would gain a lot and not only that, they'll read some of the things that affect women only and then see why maybe their wives or uh, girlfriends or daughters are uh, experiencing certain things in their lives. And they may even be able to give them some advice. So it covers from the head to the toes and uh, it covers every system in the body, including the ones that are, you know, more for women, like uh, the, the women have different genital systems, women have breasts and so on. And so we, we dive into those things as well. But most of the things, whether it has to do with your heart and your breathing system and everything else is found in both men and women. So it, it could benefit men as well. Okay, so can I say that I should expect another book from you with the title Understanding Women. <laughs> Understanding Women. Yeah. <laughs> I thought you were going to say with the title saying say, a man's guide the man's to guide his to body and his total <laughs> health. <laughs> and the other thing about the book, which I, mm -hmm. I failed to mention, is the fact that it's body, soul, and spirit. So we are not just talking about your body and the diseases that affect your bodies, but also your soul and spirit. So we go into uh, mental health and uh, behavior health, and then also spiritual health, which is very dear to me because just like most of you who are on the program, uh, we have a spiritual life and some of, we have topics to guide us through our spiritual journey. 
So that's the other thing about it. Okay. So um, where do men get these books to buy? Because I, today I'm focusing on men because um, <laughs> if we don't take time, the men will leave the women to go and buy all the books. I see. So, yeah. Um, where should well, uh -huh. I think that, as you mentioned, for the men, it's a good book to buy, even for your wife for Christmas, because mm -hmm. what happens is that then she the book is in the house, so you can also read it, and not only your wife. <laughs> but mm -hmm. Auntie Jane, who is in your church, has some copies, and then also mm -hmm. there are some copies on Amazon as well. Mm -hmm. Okay. But Auntie Jane has several copies, and so it will be cheap. It will be cheaper. Yeah, it'll be than cheaper than, than in on Amazon. Amazon. Yeah. yeah. So okay. that's that's okay. that's the information that uh, I want to put out there. Okay. All right. So I think um maybe towards the later part or at the end of the program we would come back to the book and then talk about maybe specifics in in the book for okay. for the men to benefit. In fact, today, today I'm on the men because I want them to get the book. <laughs> And it will be beneficial for their household. It will make yes. them understand women. Yes. And know when to approach and when not to. Yes, mm -hmm. I think you're right. <laughs> we'll do another topic and talk more about that later. Okay. <laughs> another okay. day. Okay. So um, today, what do you have for us? Well, we are going to talk about cardiovascular health mm -hmm. or cardiovascular disease. And, uh, you know, it's a very big umbrella because mm -hmm. it encompasses a lot of stuff. Mm -hmm. And most of the time I like to use slides because then you can go back and look at them and uh, read them and so on. So I have slides um, on that. And cardiovascular disease is what we'll talk about today. So we'll, we'll go as far as we can with, okay. with what I have. Okay. Um, yeah. So... You can keep rolling it and then I will then come in when you want to and so on and so All right. forth. All right. So as the title says, what are cardiovascular diseases? Because that's what we are going to talk about. And as you can see, it's made up of two words, cardio and vascular. Cardio means heart and vascular means blood vessels. So that's the combination. Um, and there are many uh, cardiovascular diseases. Uh, like we said, the heart is one of the organs that has cardiovascular diseases. And some of them are ones that we are familiar with. You know, they are like heart attacks, coronary artery disease. And uh, for those who are not familiar, coronary arteries are the arteries that supply the heart with oxygen and nutrients and they are found around the heart and so the heart itself needs supply of oxygen and nutrients so it has a it has arteries and those are known as coronary artery and those arteries can get diseased and then also heart failure then uh, rhythm problems of the heart you know uh, in terms of the rhythm of the heart, whether it becomes irregular and so on. And then heart valve problems, heart muscle problems, and then uh, last but not the least, congenital heart disease. So all of these are cardiovascular diseases that have to do with the heart. And I know that uh, some weeks ago you had um, somebody come on, talk about uh, congenital heart disease, I believe, because of a little baby who had it. Yeah. And then the other big area is stroke, which is uh, happens in the brain. Okay. And then the last part is blood vessels, like we mentioned. And sometimes people don't realize that we can have diseases in the blood vessels that supply the arms and the legs. And we'll talk about that a little bit. And then the neck, we have some vessels in the neck as well. And those are, when they are affected, they are called peripheral vascular disease because they are in the peripheral, like the outside, as opposed to the inside, like the, where the heart is. So that encompasses some. But as my next slide shows, some are more uh, common the, uh, than others. And... Um, 
we find out that, you know, why are cardiovascular diseases import, important? And they are very important because there are about 70 million people worldwide who die from cardiovascular diseases. And uh, they also account for uh, all about a third of all global deaths. Um, so they are very important. And they found out that heart attacks and uh, stroke make up about 85%. So the brain and the heart, you know, they make up about, about 40, 85% of deaths uh, that we had mentioned. And so, so um, that's why it's important. Mm -hmm. So um, talking about the epidemiology, mm -hmm. where do we say the prevalence? Is it among uh, Blacks or it's among uh, White or Asians? Or... That's uh, interesting. Actually, it, it's, it's common in all races okay. and not just one particular race. And we'll find out, and even right now, it's growing more in the... Uh, low and medium developed countries, which before we thought, oh, they are just infectious diseases, but you find out that it's also growing there. And actually, uh, WHO had said that now a lot of cardiovascular diseases occur in those countries. And it's because the things leading to cardiovascular disease are not well controlled in those countries, mm -hmm. as opposed to the Western world. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And they think that at one time it looked like they were dropping, like cases were dropping, but all of a sudden the drop has kind of become, um, what should I use? It's not dropping as fast as we thought. And that is because of the fact that there's increased obesity and diabetes all over um, the world now. And that are some of the risk factors leading to uh, cardiovascular diseases. Okay. Mm -hmm. And I was making a comment that some of them are more common than the others. And the six most common cardiovascular diseases are heart attacks, coronary artery disease, which is related to heart attacks, and stroke or mini stroke, which is also known as TIA. Okay, those are the main three, three main ones. Of course, we also have other heart conditions like heart failure, irregular heartbeat, and then congenital heart diseases, which of course tends to be more in children. We are going to zero in on the first three, which are the coronary artery disease, heart attacks, and strokes, because all of them have an underlying factor known as atherosclerosis of arteries. And what is atherosclerosis? Atherosclerosis is when the blood vessels are lined with a combination of cholesterol, fats, calcium and other substances. And actually the interesting thing is that even in childhood, our blood vessels start getting lined with these substances, but they are very thin in childhood and it's known as uh, fatty streaks. And, um, but as we grow older and our lifestyle, our genes, our race, all family history, if all of all of these can contribute to the buildup of atherosclerosis, and it's known as plaque, and we're going to talk a little bit about plaque, okay, made up of this, and it can be hardened. That's why sometimes they say um, hard, hardening of the arteries, and that is caused by the buildup of plaque. So we have a short video telling us a little bit about what atherosclerosis is, and it's from the um, NIH. And so Eddie will be showing that in a second.
just two minutes, but it explains a little bit. Death for both men. In the United States, coronary heart disease is the number one cause of death for both men and women. Coronary heart disease is a disease in which a waxy substance called plaque builds up inside the coronary arteries, which supply oxygen-rich blood to your heart. The buildup of plaque over time causes a hardening and narrowing of the arteries called atherosclerosis. Atherosclerosis can lead to serious problems, including heart attack, stroke, or even death. Healthy arteries are strong and elastic. They become narrow between heartbeats, and they help keep your blood pressure consistent. This helps blood move through your body. In atherosclerosis, plaque builds up inside your arteries. Plaque is made up of fat, cholesterol, calcium, and other substances found in the blood. Over time, plaque hardens and narrows your coronary arteries. The buildup of plaque limits the flow of oxygen-rich blood to your heart, which can cause chest pain or discomfort called angina. Eventually, an area of plaque can rupture or break open. If the plaque ruptures, a blood clot can form on its surface. A large blood clot can mostly or completely block the flow of blood through a coronary artery, which can cause a heart attack. Atherosclerosis is a common health problem. The main treatment for atherosclerosis is lifestyle changes, such as following a healthy diet, quitting smoking, and being physically active. You also may need medicines and medical procedures. These treatments, along with ongoing medical care, can help you live a healthier life. For more information, go to the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute website at www.nhlbi. Dot nih.gov. Okay. Okay. So that explained some of the. Uh, if you're a Maryland homeowner that pays more than sixty-seven dollars a month for electricity, you may qualify to go solar for zero dollars out of pocket. <laughs> Our YouTube is still playing. Yes, I think so. <laughs> yeah, close it. Okay. Those are the disadvantages of listening to important information. Then they have the ads, but <laughs> but I think that information was uh, quite uh, educative, and I, I hope that very, everybody very yeah gained something. So we had on on that video how coronary artery disease uh, is one type of um, uh, cardiovascular disease, and it's the buildup of plaque. And then when the plaque builds up it bursts open, uh, it forms a clot, and then it can block the coronary artery, then you get heart attack because it means that the muscles around that area are not being supplied with blood. And uh, you end up with a heart attack or what we call a myocardial infarction or MI. And then, Peripheral artery disease, sometimes people don't know much about this, but like I said, it happens in your extremities, in your hand, in your arms and in your legs. And it tends to be quite common in um, people with diabetes, for example, uh, because, uh, and then those who have high cholesterol, because what happens is that, just like we said, the plaque will build up in those arteries. And then what happens is that then your lower body, for example, your legs, your are not being supplied with enough blood. And so you can even have gangrene and people have amputation. They have a little cut and it's not healing because the blood supply is very slow. And so um, they may end up with amputated legs and the, um, it can also happen in your upper extremities. And the interesting thing is, if you are a diabetic, you know, the increased blood sugar in your system tends to cause the lining of blood vessels to be affected, to be disrupted in a way. And then plaque starts building. 
So it's very important as a as a diabetic that you make sure that uh, your sugar is well controlled. And uh, people would tell you, yeah, I'll just throw this in since we are talking about arterial disease, is the fact that uh, some people will tell you that if you have coronary artery disease, don't be surprised if as a male, you are having problems with erection problems because maybe your blood supply also to that genitalia area is being affected, just like it's being affected uh, to your coronary artery in, in the heart. Okay, so that that... That is, uh, that is something that people would uh, tell you about. And, and of course, if you have diabetes by itself, that also leads to uh, erectile dysfunction because of either blood flow or because the nerves are being affected by the high sugars. But that's another topic. But anyway. A quick question. <laughs> uh -huh. Amongst these, where do we find um, deep vein thrombosis? Okay, so that is another thing because with deep vein thrombosis, we are talking about a vein. Okay. Okay, and these have to do with arteries. Okay. Okay, yes, so that's the main difference. Okay. Uh, with DVT, where you have a blockage in your veins, um, in the deep veins in your legs, you know, you go on a trip, you sit down for too long, you are not walking around, or you may have congenital um, congenital problems associated with uh, how your clotting mechanism works and so on. Mm -hmm. And then you can end up with a DVT. And of course, even people with uh, COVID infections sometimes end up with a DVT. And then that can go into your lungs and cause what we call pulmonary embolism, where you have clots all over in the lungs. So those tend to, those are vein, that's a vein problem as opposed to an artery problem in this case. Okay. I think it was a viewer's question, so maybe okay. you don't understand this very well. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. So we talked a little bit about how do we get this plaque buildup? We mentioned the fact that plaque is made up of cholesterol and so on. And also what happens is if you have high blood pressure, you are prone to plaque build up. And one of the reasons could be also because if your blood pressure is not well controlled, it can also damage the lining of the vessels. Okay. And then you have the buildup of the atherosclerosis, like we mentioned earlier on. And then of course, if you have high cholesterol, they want a place to go to so they will go and line the vessels, okay? High triglycerides, which are also a type of uh, lipids, are also a risk factor for plaque buildup. Smoking tends to cause um, the plaque to build up some more. And in a recent study, which just came out, they talked about how vaping, because some people say, oh, I'm not actually smoking cigarettes, I'm vaping. But they found out that those who vape are also at increased risk to stroke. And that was a recent study which was published uh, like the last week, I think. Oh, okay. Yeah, okay. yeah. The other things are diabetes, which we've talked about. Obesity also leads to that. And um, excessive alcohol intake. Um, all of these, uh, and it, what another condition which is related to diabetes and obesity known as insulin resistance can also do that. So you find out that all of these conditions can affect how the lining of your blood vessels look like. So a quick question. Yeah. Excessive, excessive alcohol intake. Are you saying that we, we can drink, but not that much that <laughs> well they, they found out that a little right red wine may be good for your health anyway but mm -hmm. uh, people have different opinions about uh, <laughs> drinking yeah but uh, it's you see alcohol is very interesting a little bit in the form of red wine will help your health but then at the other extreme if it's excessive 
then you are getting a problem. Mm -hmm. So this is partly what we showed on the video, but uh, so I won't go into much detail on that. Mm -hmm. It's just the coronary artery. Remember, coronary artery surrounds your heart. They are the blood vessels that supply the heart itself, the heart muscle with nutrients and with oxygen. So you may have coronary artery disease and you may not have a heart attack, okay? Because maybe the coronary arteries are not, um, the, the blockage is very small. Maybe it's 25% blocked or maybe it's 50% blocked. But we mentioned on the video that when a plaque breaks open, you know, it attracts platelets. Platelets are what helps our blood to clot when you cut yourself. And so you have all of these clot forming substances will come around and try to cover the broken surface of the plaque. But in doing so, they are also um, decreasing the, the, the um, internal um, diameter of of the artery and we have a name for the clot It's called a thrombus and it will keep enlarging as more platelets come around and it will block the artery and once it's blocked it means the blood cannot flow forward and if it can't flow forward then it means that the area in front of it is derived and that is the muscles basically when you are talking about the heart is 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 deprived of um of nutrients and oxygen rich blood which every cell needs including the cells of the heart and so when you don't have that what happens the muscle will die and that is why we call it myocardial infarction infarction means death okay and as we know heart attacks can be different some may be mild somebody has a mild attack or somebody has a severe one where he dies right away and the other, moving to the brain, we can also talk about stroke atherosclerosis. And it's the same kind of uh, situation where, as you see in this diagram, you see a normal artery on the left and on the right, you see an artery which has uh, atherosclerosis and it has a, a blood clot. And so in the same way, blood cannot flow through the artery areas of the brain are deprived of oxygen and nutrients and you have a stroke the cells in that area either die or they are deprived of those things and they suffer and that is manifested in parts of our body the left side or the right side you will have weakness etc as we know in stroke So before before that, a quick question. Um, how does my family history affect my health, my heart health? Yes, it does. Because some people, especially if you have uh, a father, especially on the male side, who has a heart attack uh, before the age of 55, you know, mm -hmm. then you find out that there might be family history after um in terms of uh one of the the, the things is um in terms of even cholesterol and uh, other lipids you know because some people have got lipid problems like that where the lipid levels are so high that uh they cause the blockage uh quickly and so family history is important and we always ask about family history when uh, people come to see us. Um, and as you know, some of the uh, risk factors like high blood pressure that we mentioned can run in families. Yeah. And so if it is not well controlled, all of that can affect you and cause increase in your atherosclerosis. Mm -hmm. And so this is just a quick slide on types of stroke and i mean 
uh, a topic on stroke will deal with more detail on that, but you can have one where there's lack of blood supply lack and oxygen to a part of the brain, like we mentioned, and that is called ischemic stroke, okay, because there's lack of blood supply to an area, and that's the most common type of stroke. Uh, affected, um, it, it's probably about 80 to 87 percent of strokes are of this type where there's lack of blood supply to an area of the brain. And um, sometimes it is also stems from a clot from your heart. Uh, you remember we mentioned something about irregular heartbeats. And one of the problems that happens is a condition known as atrial fibrillation or atrial AFib. And that is when the heart is not pumping well. Now, if the heart is not pumping, but it's kind of doing something like this, then the blood is not flowing out of the heart well. And so it stagnates in some part of the heart. And then it can form a clot. And that clot can go up through into your brain and, and cause a problem, OK? And so atrial fibrillation, which is an irregular uh, type of heartbeat, is very important that it is controlled when you, when a person has atrial fibrillation. So and, a good question. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Do you recommend, or what devices do you recommend for home use to check um, regular heartbeat? Well, these days, well, first of all, a blood pressure machine. I'd say that anybody who has a diagnosis of high blood pressure should have a blood pressure machine. They are on sale on Amazon. You can get one from $25 to $150, depending on the type you want. Mm -hmm. But in a, in a talk that I did uh, some time ago, I mentioned to us that I think that the one that you put around your calf and uh, your upper arm, sorry, upper arm is probably more accurate than the one you use on your wrist, okay? Yeah, and so if you can invest in a blood pressure cuff, you will be able to check your blood pressure. Maybe once a week, you can check it and see how am I doing? And usually blood pressure machines will also have pulse, your pulse or your heart rate. And even some of them are able to detect irregular heart if it is irregular, yeah. you know? And then the other thing, that can check your pulses, the pulse oximeter that a lot of people have bought since COVID came to check their oxygen level. On it, it gives your oxygen saturation. And the other thing it gives is your pulse rate. And some of them are able also to detect irregular pulses. Um, and you sometimes, you can even feel if your heart is beating irregular. Mm -hmm. But remember, not every irregular heartbeat means that you have atrial fibrillation. Atrial fibrillation is quite different. Um, as you grow older, you may have some irregular uh, heartbeats uh, occurring, and those are benign. They are not serious uh, ones like atrial fibrillation. Mm -hmm. And sometimes with that, when a doctor or a nurse listens to your heart, they will find out that for, for the one which is not a serious one, they may find out that the beat, one beat comes quicker. You know, after several beats, one beat comes quicker. And that is quite common when you over people, common in people over 50, 60, 70 years, you, it's quite common. We call them PVCs. Okay. Um, yeah. So that's different from the AFib that I'm talking about. Then the other kind of stroke is hemorrhagic stroke. This is when there's a burst of a weakened blood vessel uh, in the brain, causing the brain to bleed. And this stroke, type of stroke, tends to ki kill people quite quickly uh, when you have that one, because the blood vessel just bursts and the blood is all over the place and uh, there's shortage of blood supply to the various parts of the brain and not just one particular part. And so uh, that's called a hemorrhagic stroke. Um, if we look at the next, uh -huh. so this is a picture of arteries in the different types of stroke. 
the one towards our left, I, I don't know whether it, it shows a blood vessel that has burst. And so the, 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 the blood is squirting out of it, you know, and that's the hemorrhagic stroke. And then the one on the right is the ischemic stroke. Yes, uh, you have the pointer on it. Thank you. <laughs> and that's where you have a blood vessel which uh, uh, where a clot has formed and then it's traveling up and it gets lodged in one branch of that artery. And so it will bo block the blood supply to that area. And, and that is reflected in the part of the body that that brain area controls. And so this is a quick one. I know I have a lot of slides, but just remember uh, the, uh, the stroke, American Stroke uh, uh, Society talks about, uh, to remember stroke, think about the word fast. Um, and so with, Okay, we'll talk about CHF uh, later. But with the word FAST, it shows F-A-S-T. F is your face. You have a drooping to one side of your face because of weakness of one part of the face. And then you have an arm weakness. So people's arm will drop, you know, when they, it's weak, so it drops. And then speech difficulty, they can't talk well. You, they, you can't understand their words. And then the, the last one is the T. It's time to call 911. Um, it's not time to give them water to drink or anything like that. It's time to because when 911 comes there and they, some, they are able to rush the person to the hospital, these days, not every stroke remains a stroke. If you get there in time and they do a CT scan in time and all the stuff that they need to do, they can burst the clot. They can go in and use a medicine to burst the clot. And so you have somebody who came to the ER and they, uh, they, are, they had a stroke with one side of their face drooping and they are hurriedly gone into the ER and uh, to the um, radiology department. They do the studies and they give them that clot buster. And then you find out that within an hour, they are back to normal, you know, because the clot has been burst. And it's the same with um, heart attack. If you have a clot somewhere, they take you to the cath lab, they go quickly and uh, they can burst, the, uh, remove the clot. And so time in, in medicine, they say time is muscle when it comes to the heart, you know, you do you, you need to hurry up so the muscle does not die. That's why they say time is muscle. So you have to quickly go to the emergent, uh, uh, to call 911 and so that they can come. And, and sometimes in some places, even the 911 people will may be able to even start some type of therapy or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, that's that. Other symptoms we know of stroke may be vision loss. People may have vision loss in one eye or in both eyes, or they may not be able to walk. We've all seen pictures of people who have had stroke. There may be confusion, severe headache that cannot be explained. And then they have coordination and balance prob problems. So all of these are signs. And um, I think my, my next slide is talking about mini stroke probably. Is that a heart, TIA? The interesting thing about TIA or a mini stroke is that with that, there's just a temporary temporary blockage of the uh, vessel, okay? Uh, uh, so what happens to, is that part of that brain area does not receive uh, the nutrients and the oxygen, but soon that clot dissolves by itself or dislodges, okay? And so the symptoms will go away. And this can last anywhere from five minutes to 24 hours, okay, up to that time. Usually if it's more than 24 hours, then we say it's a full-blown stroke. But uh, within that time, you know, um, you revert back to normal. And when that happens, you just don't say, oh, uh, he, he had this thing, now he's better. Uh, yes, thanks be to God, but there's more stuff that has to be done. 
now that he is better, he has to go and be worked up. You know, we do a workup for you to see is there and is what is your cholesterol like? Do you have a a, a narrow artery in your in there? Do you have AFib? What is it? Why did you have the TIA? And the reason it's important is that about 30% of people with TIA go on to develop a full stroke within a year, you know? Mm -hmm. So that's why it's important that TIA is taken serious. And also they found out that about 40% um, of people who have a full blown stroke, when you go over the history, they will tell you that, oh, I had a time when something happened to me, a TIA, and they didn't really um, pay attention, yes. you know? Yeah, so that's important. And those are the other symptoms that you can have. We talked about numbness and tingling, dizziness, uh, balance problems, the headache, the slurred speech. You see, somebody will have slurred speech, and then soon the speech comes back to normal. And I've heard this many times, even amongst my patients and even here and even in Ghana, you know, they said, oh, his speech went away. It was kind of slurred. Then he came back and people are happy and they think, well, then nothing has happened. But actually, it's a warning that you should go for a work up for stroke. So after a year and having developed a full blown, uh, full blown stroke, mm -hmm. should I sit down and then wait? Oh no, that's why um, you should make sure that whatever measures were put in place, whether it is your cholesterol, they put you on cholesterol medicine, whether your blood pressure was not well controlled, but it's well controlled now, whether they discovered that there was blockage, atherosclerosis in your carotid artery. When that happens, they sometimes have to go and do surgery to remove the clot, okay. you know, and put a stent there. Well, remove uh, the um, the atherosclerotic area. Yeah. And the it's interesting how they kind of take it out, you know, and they may put a stent in there to keep it open. And and th that, that will help with the blood supply over to your, to your brain. Mm -hmm. So there are measures that have to be taken and we, we don't sit around and we'll talk a little bit about some of them uh, as we go on. Yeah. So a quick one. Can TIA be detected on the EKGs? No. Remember, TIA has to do with your brain. EKG has to do with your heart. What? Yes. It's rather uh, on EKG, you may be able to detect whether a person has had a heart attack before because the EKG will be of a certain uh, display or whether the person is having decreased blood flow to part of the heart. And that's why when you have chest pain and you go to the emergency room, one of the first things they'll do is a EKG. Or even if you come to the doctor's office and you say, oh, I had chest pain like a week ago or whatever, then we'll do an EKG to see whether did a week ago, did you have a silent heart attack? And that's another thing. There are silent heart attacks that can happen. And, and um, you would see that uh, we would see from the EKG. So remember that EKG has to do with the heart, not the brain. Okay. okay. The next one. Okay. And then this, I put this slide in because I wanted to remind women that we are at risk for uh, coronary artery disease and cardiovascular disease uh, at, as men, especially after menopause. Okay, they sometimes think maybe estrogen protects that a, a little bit before menopause. But after menopause, we are at the same risk as men. And women, some of their risk factors are the family history of early heart disease, like we mentioned earlier on, you know. And then mental stress and depression actually affects women's hearts more than men. And that's why we need to de-stress and find ways in which we can uh, put our burdens down, you know, and not carry them around. And then women with diabetes tend to develop heart disease 
uh, more than men with diabetes. And then even before uh, menopause, when you're talking about blood pressure, some people, as you know, when they are pregnant, they get high blood pressure. They get hypertension and other things, and they call it preeclampsia or, or so. And that makes you get an increased risk of developing high blood pressure. And I don't mind saying it. When I was pregnant with my um, last born, that was many years ago. <laughs> He's about 28 now. But um, oh. I developed, uh, I went to work one day and I started having a severe headache, you know. And I was like eight months pregnant or maybe I was about eight and a half pregnant. I had a very severe headache, you know, and my feet were swollen. So I went to see my OB and when they did the test, they, they saw that my blood pressure was way up. And then other things are like you have protein in the urine and all that. And when that happens, they have to put med IV uh, medicine on you to try to decrease the blood pressure and they will try to deliver the baby quickly. quickly and yeah. so and that happened. But later down the years, I developed high blood pressure and I also have a strong family history. Okay. So uh, that happened. So this is just my own example, mm -hmm. but not just high blood pressure in pregnancy, but even diabetes in, in some people, they are not diabetic, but when they are pregnant, then you find out that their sugar goes high and they have to be put on diabetic medicine or insulin or so on. They'll find out that when after pregnancy, um, they may get better. But down the road, you know, there is an increased risk of developing diabetes. Developing diabetes. Yeah. 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 And those who have low children who are low birth weight or those who um, also um, have preeclampsia, which, which is what I had. You know, they are prone to um, high blood pressure and those kind of things. So I thought we'll talk a little bit about cardiovascular disease in kids uh, because our time is going. We're already 47 yeah. minutes. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, you find out that we talk about birth defects mm -hmm. or congenital defects which are present at birth. And about 30% of all birth defects are due to uh, congenital heart disease. And I believe you guys had a talk on it uh, not too long ago, not right? Too long ago, yes, yeah. we did. So, and they tend to cause deaths in infants. You know, it depends on the type of heart disease that they have uh, developed. Um, and also, uh, the most common one is called v VSD, ventricular septal defect, where there's a, a defect, or they call it hole in the heart, okay? And most of them actually are small and they may close by themselves, but not all of them close. So that was that was a question I was coming to that most yeah. people think that they will close by itself so they don't seek medical attention. Yeah, it's so important that, that the pediatrician, yeah, the pediatrician keep an eye on it. Yeah, you're right. Okay, the next one is stroke in children. So we talked about uh, heart disease in children and stroke in children. And the, the time is going, but the one that I want to emphasize is because we all come from Ghana, the, the common, there are several things which may cause stroke in children when they have heart issues with their valves and they, are, they have had cardiac surgery or in, they are in cardiac surgery, then they may end up with a clot and so on. And those who have abnormal blood vessels in the brain, they can have stroke. And those who have clotting di disorders, but the one that I want to mention is sickle cell disease. As we know, sickle cell is quite common in Ghana. Mm -hmm. And what happens is that the sickle cells, their shape, of course, are different from normal red blood cells. And so what they do is that they can clog the blood vessels. Mm -hmm. and, and they can also, the sickle cells can also damage the vessels. Mm -hmm. And in doing that, like we said before, the same kind of, uh, picture we got we, when we we're talking about uh, adults who had a clot in their brain. When the sickle cells clog the blood vessels and they affect oxygen and nutrients to parts of the brain. And so you find out that in children with sickle cell, 
they can have an overt stroke where one side of the body is weak and all the normal things that we see in adults, or they can end up with what they call silent strokes. And they said that about 40% of children who have SS, sickle cell disease SS, have silent strokes, which nobody knows about. But when you do an MRI, you see that that a part of the brain is got the picture of a stroke, okay? And what silent stroke does is that it affects the children learning and decision-making problems and thinking. So sometimes you may have a kid with sickle cell and you don't know that kid has had a silent stroke and they are in school and they seem to not be doing well in school or whatever. Maybe they've had a silent stroke, you know, and they have um, methods of treating uh, or preventing strokes in, in kids with sickle, sickle cell disease because there's a test that they do to screen the children who may be prone to a high risk of having a stroke. So they have methods of uh, preventing that by giving them uh, certain medications and uh, blood transfusions. Yeah. So the important part of this talk is this, and I need to talk about this, is the risk factors. We've mentioned some of them. We've mentioned uh, hypertension, high, cigarette smoking, or even vaping. vaping. Those who mm -hmm. think that oh, vaping is fine. You, you, you heard me talk about the recent study. Yeah. Uh, diabetes, high cholesterol and triglycerides, physical inactivity, overweight, obesity, and dietary factors like high salt intake, high sodium intake, low intake of fruits and veggies, and man not managing your stress. And among this, high blood pressure is very important. Uh, please, can we have the next slide? I, I, I put in the next slide, which shows um, that um, though if you have not been diagnosed with uh, cardiovascular disease, then there's something we can do, which means primary prevention. It means you haven't gotten the condition yet, but you are taking steps so that you don't get it. And it's the lifestyle changes, eating healthy. You know, when you look at your plate, how much rice is in the plate and how much vegetables are on the plate, it's important that we increase our vegetables. You eat the rainbow, like they say, and it means different colors of vegetables, red peppers, yellow peppers, you know, uh, cucumbers, all those uh, things, you know, green ones, broccoli, all that stuff. And then fruits, salad, you know, people laugh at me. Almost every day I eat salad for lunch. Um, that's what I eat uh, for lunch every day. Salad with a little piece of chicken or something. And people say, don't you get tired of it? But that's the way I'm getting my vegetables in. Um, and fruits, nuts. I like nuts. You know, I like uh, almond nuts. And they have the good fats in them, uh, the monosaturated fats. And then whole grains. You know, instead of eating white bread, eat whole grain bread, you know. And lean animal protein and fish. Fish is very important. It has the omega-3 uh, fatty acids yes. in it. Yeah. And we should minimize processed meats, you know, whether it is um, uh, bacon or uh, sausage uh, and uh, bologna and all that stuff that uh, people um, eat and they sell. They, they've put a whole lot of stuff in them. And refined carbs. Let's go for carbs that are complex carbs, you know, um, and those are made with grains that are whole grain and avoid the sweetened beverages. Um, they talk about the fact that Christians, a lot of Christians, they don't drink, so they don't drink alcohol. So they drink a lot of beverage, sweetened beverages. <laughs> yeah. And we have to be careful about that because that lays down a lot of calories and they, they are, uh, deposited in your liver, you know, excess calories. Uh, we need to lose weight. It's a tough thing, but let's try and do it. 
engage in walking or exercise every week, you know, and in diabetics, especially lifestyle changes are very, very important because you don't know what is going on in your vessels. Okay. And so, then um, uh -huh, go ahead. With the lifestyle um, changes, mm -hmm. you know, um, when we were growing up, uh, we were told that when you eat egg, don't take the yolk. Then yeah. now they come and tell us that we should eat more eggs. So <laughs> yeah. What do we stand with egg? Well, with the eggs, apart from diabetics, mm -hmm. most people can have a, an egg every day, you know. And what I tell people is what I do. I think I have an egg Monday to Friday mm -hmm. or almost every day, but I have one egg. And then do you know what I do? Mm -hmm. I add um egg white to it okay i was telling a patient this week uh, was it yesterday or saturday she said she eats some people they eat three eggs three you know? eggs. Yeah. You go, i mean so a lifestyle experience let me tell you this mm -hmm. i came to the u.s and then i went to the canteen yeah uh -huh. a fried egg and then all of a sudden we, i mean ghana we used to take one one egg at a yes time. they fried yeah. the eggs together for me and i was so happy i mean <laughs> <laughs> but they found out that for most people, the dietary mm -hmm. cholesterol actually that you eat is doesn't contribute too much to your total cholesterol as much as what your body itself produces, which is related to your genes. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, but then for diabetics, if you eat too much egg yolk, you may have a problem. And I have people who are uh, probably not diabetics and their cholesterol looked okay then they came back and their cholesterol is high. i said what i said oh i'm eating three eggs a day okay. i said oh okay maybe you should have just one egg and add uh, egg white so you that just egg add egg white to it or if you like and you don't want the yolk just do egg white you know and you find out that you have enough egg to eat and feel full but you are not eating as much yolk okay okay so, and of course, those who smoking should quit smoking. And then another important thing is that sometimes I have patients, their blood pressure is high or their sugars are high. Instead of going on medicine, they say, oh, I'll tr lifestyle changes. Whether you are on medicine or not, you should be doing lifestyle changes. And they'll say, oh, I don't want medicine. I want to use natural or whatever. And when they say that, they are not even referring to um and necessarily the lifestyle changes, you know, they may want to go and buy something over the counter and use. Okay. But you find out that once, if you have high blood pressure, for example, if you keep resisting, what's happening is that that high blood pressure is causing problems. And that's what one person was asking about congestive heart failure. Mm -hmm. You know, your heart fails when it keeps having to pump so hard against the pressure that is in the vessels. And then it becomes weakened. And that's one of the reasons where we get congestive heart failure. Okay. And so uh, let us take our medicines and then do the lifestyle changes because in the end, it will benefit us. And I, I'm not, I'm, I'm on high blood pressure medicine, you know, and that's it. I'm on it and I take it. And right now, when I measure my blood pressure, it's like 115 over, you know, something 80 yeah. or 70. And it's good. And I'm happy about that, you know. So let's do, let's make sure we take our medicines and not resist when we are asked to go on medicines. And sometimes one thing that your doctor can also do, especially if you don't have coronary artery disease or you don't have a stroke or something, you can ask them to calculate your risk for atherosclerotic uh, disease. And there's a formula that is used based on whether you are male, female, based on whether you have high blood pressure, based on your cholesterol level, you know, based on whether you are a smoker uh, and so on. And we are able to calculate and give a percentage. And based on, and I did that for a patient actually today. Mm -hmm. uh, I, yeah, I, I had the sheet. I brought it. I wanted to, but I calculated mm -hmm. it. She doesn't have 
heart attack. She hasn't had coronary artery disease. She hasn't had a stroke. But her cholesterol numbers were high. And when I put the numbers in, um, it gave a certain percentage. And the good thing about it is when it's calculated, it says at the bottom, based on your risk, your 10-year risk for atherosclerotic disease, mm -hmm. uh, going on a statin, and the statin is the medicine, uh, is the cholesterol medicine we use to try to decrease atherosclerosis and not increase the amount. You will benefit on a moderate uh, dose of uh, uh, statin. And so we came to, we discussed that and she said, yes, I would like to do it. So we started it. So that's it. And the last thing is, like we said, buy your own blood pressure cuff and use it at home if you have high blood pressure. If you don't even have high blood pressure, but you've had a stroke before, etc., you could use it to check it, you know. So my main takeaway is that lifestyle changes are important for all of us. Let's work on that. You know, even in Ghana, people are getting all of these diseases because people are eating the foods we are eating here. They are going to Kentucky Fried Chicken. They are going to Burger King. They are going to the fast foods. And they are also spending a lot of time in their cars. They are not walking like before. So that is a big problem. And, and in that case, that's where I think Europe and Britain are very good because people walk a lot. Mm -hmm. And anyway, take our medicines. Let's take our medicines. And let our doctor calculate our 10-year risk for atherosclerotic disease. And then let's try and walk. You know, I say walking is the best, cheapest exercise. You don't have to pay for it. Every lunchtime, most days, lunchtime, after I finish my lunch, I go and walk, you know, because that's the time that I can walk. And I walk and I pray, you know, so I do that. And then let's exercise. They found a recent, recent um, actually recent study showed that uh, the people who have stroke, when they start exercising, they decrease uh, incidence of dying by 50% compared to those who don't exercise after a stroke. And they also find out that increased sitting, okay, under 60 years of age, increases your risk of stroke. So even when we are watching TV, we we'll get up and go to the uh, kitchen and get a glass of water, you know, get up and stand, uh, walk around a little bit, do some movement. People dance. Some people, they'll put music on and start dancing. It's a very good form of exercise. And use your smartwatch, you know, it will help you to know how many steps you've done. The good thing is that those of us who are older, we don't have to do the 10,000 that is mentioned. Anywhere between four, five and seven, five, is is good enough it will help us it will prolong our lives so me when i look at my smartwatch and my number of steps is less i walk up and down my steps at home here to get it to the number that i want to yeah. i mean it sounds crazy but this is just a way for me to get more steps in and with that said thank you so much for your attention <laughs> okay so i think uh, there was a question in uh it it was okay. Ebenezer Wesley was asking, Where does a ruptured brain aneurysm fall in all this? That is a stroke, yeah. That is it, it is a stroke and it's a hemorrhag hemorrhagic stroke. Mm -hmm. It okay. is a, because remember, it causes the aneurysm becomes like a balloon, then it bursts. Mm -hmm. And it, some people also they have just by uh, birth, they have what we call malformations of their vessels. So the vessels too are quite weak. And so they too can uh, burst open and then you get a hemorrhagic stroke. Okay. So um, um, this Lucia Hini too was asking, please, what, uh, I think what about- Yeah, the, the thing about uh, sickle cell trait, mm -hmm. they found out that that increased risk of stroke that we mentioned, it's mostly in SS. And then those who have S and beta thalassemia uh, combined. So those 
other people don't have that increase the increased risk in throws is also in sc sc uh, patients but those who have as for example they are not in they are not um in that category and so in most places in in good places where they have good care of sickle cell patients they find out that they start screening them with uh, um, ultrasound where they take they want to look at the velocity of the blood flow in their brain and they use a transcranial doubler to find it and when they find out that the blood flow is very high you it puts you at a high risk for stroke so what they do is that they put them on regular uh, blood uh, transfusions and also they found a new the new medicine known as hydroxyurea that they used to treat sickle cell they found that it lowers the risk of stroke in sickle cell patients okay all right dr Antua. um i think there's no question but my question or suggestion or uh, appeal is that when are we coming to treat the other disease that other heart related diseases that we we made mention of <laughs> okay well uh, another time <laughs> <laughs> another time okay so Bob from what he says thanks uh paulina she says thanks christiana so, okay so i think whilst i'm scrolling through the things um your final words for us well my final word is my final slide it mm -hmm. said that you know small steps uh small efforts can lead to great changes okay. so please don't be overwhelmed what i want you to do is consider what small step can i do can i walk up the stairs at work instead of take the elevator that's a small step but it will go a long way because like i told you even in the studies just standing and not being sedentary has been found to increase lifespan so small steps let's do small steps okay yours may be 15 minutes walk three times a week or whatever just do your small steps you may just walk up and down your stairs if you live you know in a story building small steps so let's try and do the small steps thank you very much thank you very much for yeah. coming to you and your heart again i mean i think this is is it the fourth i've lost count of yes i know you've got you guys have seen too much of me <laughs> and i know you'll be coming back um dr Tentua has a book on women's health yes dr Tentua has a book on women's health and we've talked about the book and uh, let me yeah. let me project it again uh uh where, where did i where did i keep this book okay so, i think yeah. it was yeah and auntie jane has copies and look you see all this stuff that i even talked about it's there it's in the book it's in yeah. the book yeah it's in the book you know so please like how we say, <laughs> it's in the Read book it. put all your questions together uh -huh. and bring all your questions and dr Angel will come back to talk to us about our concerns with yes to whatever is in the book especially the men please buy it yes. and read yes and give it as a gift to your wives and your girlfriends and whatever <laughs> so, <laughs> well it's been yeah. nice being here i always enjoy when i have spent my time with you oh, and, and uh, I mean, thank you for having we are, me we have fast past time but i mean people are enjoying it so i had to keep our time going so <laughs> now um we thank you very much we thank you very very much um, good lifestyle good eating habit drinking a lot of oh, okay she says i have copies contact me for your copy okay we will contact you for copies yes um, and so dr Ensua, we thank you very much myself Irikua, and your lovely viewers and listeners and the Beniza methodist church and now all the methodist church um uh, ghana methodist church us canada europe ghana we thank you very much for honoring our invitation um we know that anytime we call upon you you would come back to talk to us more about our health because we need to be healthy thank you very much thank you bye-bye everybody bye. <laughs> Okay, so um, viewers, thank you very much. Um, today, Irekwa has taken a leave, a little leave, and so I had to be 
uh, hosting at the same time co-hosting. But hopefully next week, Iroqua would be with us. Um, thank you for watching us. And if you have any concerns, send your questions to EMC, uh, you and your health at gmail.com or just shoot me a text message with your questions. Buy Dr. Ntua's book, read it. If you have any questions, just shoot me with your questions and I would let Dr. Ntua know. And then when she's ready, she would come back to talk to us. Next week, we are going to have a nice presenter, a very good presenter, as good as all the presenters that we've had on this program on in next week or next week to come and talk to us about an, a nice topic that I don't want to disclose now. I would put the poster on there. So be, be watchful for the poster and stay tuned. Thank you very much. Bye.